Professor Stevenson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Why don't we start off with your, with your background? Where'd you come from? Uh, what did you study and what have you been working on and where are you now? Sure. So I um, graduated from Harvard University with my JD from Harvard Law School and a PhD in political science back in 2003. After that, I spent a couple of years clerking for federal judges in Washington, D.C. And then I returned to start as an assistant professor on the Harvard Law School faculty back in 2005. And I've been here ever since. The topics that I work on are principally topics in public law and the intersection with politics. So I work on administrative law, statutory interpretation, separation of powers, corruption, anti-corruption, and issues related to legislative process and legislative form. So that's a, that's a wide variety of topics. Um, so is there an overarching theme to your interest in, in government and systems generally? I think the topics that most interested me back to my days in graduate school have to do with how we design decision-making systems. So people disagree about the right decision to make on any number of contested issues. And in a pluralistic society where different people, people of good faith, uh, have very different ideas about what decision ought to be made, we need to develop systems that produce some process for resolving those questions. So the decision-making authority has to be allocated to somebody, but we're uncomfortable with giving one party or entity total control. So we often design systems with checks and balances and various forms of oversight and review. And that's what I really found interesting, both in my political science studies and also when I got to law school and started to think about these issues from a legal perspective. I think those are the issues that I've always found um, most fascinating. And so since you spent some time in the judiciary uh, and in academia, so did, did any of that experience in, the, in, you know, in your clerking uh, have impact on your, on your academic work? Well, I'm sure that it did in some ways um, to the extent that my academic work engages with what judges do and how legal doctrine develops being in the room where it happens uh, as, as it were certainly was was interesting and, and influenced my thinking. There are particular corners of the law that I probably would never have thought about, except that while clerking, we had a particularly interesting and challenging case that, that implicated that corner of the law. So I'm sure that, that experience influenced my thinking. Um, I don't think it was as transformative to my thinking as my experience in law school and in my political science PhD program was in terms of my orientation towards the world and to academic problems, but it was a great experience and certainly informative. So why don't we move on to uh, you know, some of the subjects that you've covered uh, in your work, and uh, I'd like to start off with the one, I think we, it's called Democratizing the Senate. Uh, something thereabouts, uh, where you talk about um, Senate procedures and, uh, and, and, you know, can you talk through, you know, what, what are the questions that, that you had going into that, that piece of research? And did you find any interesting solutions or, or ways to try to optimize some of the processes in the Senate? Yes. Yeah, so that project that you're referring to is a, a paper called uh, Democratizing the Senate from Within, which is a joint project. Myself, my former teacher, Ken Shepsley, and my former student, Jonathan Gould, who's a professor at the UC Berkeley School of Law. And that paper is uh, motivated by a concern about two problems in the United States Senate, which are well-known problems, certainly nothing original in the paper. Uh, It has to do with the diagnosis of the problem. But one problem, much in the news these days, is the way in which the Senate's current cloture rules, that is the rules for ending debate and proceeding to a a vote on the merits, uh, enable a minority of senators to block action in most areas. So this is the so-called filibuster. So because the current cloture rule for ordinary Senate business requires uh, three-fifths majority, basically 60 senators of the full complement of 100, it is quite easy for a minority to block a whole range of actions. There are important exceptions to the filibuster. Budget reconciliation is much in the news these days as an exceptional uh, case. 
due to recent changes, appointments to both the judiciary and to executive branch offices are exempt from filibuster, but for ordinary legislative business, you need to get 60 votes. Uh, and it's just become a uh, commonplace. It's not nothing exceptional. You don't have to hold the floor. It's not reserved for matters of great importance. Just you need 60 votes for everything. The second problem, which I think should get even more attention than it does, is the Senate's extreme malapportionment. So we normally have this idea of one person, one vote, and that when drawing electoral districts, the Constitution actually has been interpreted to require that those districts be uh, in, in rough proportion. That is, that the same number of people should get the same number of representatives. That would be true when drawing state legislative districts. It's true when drawing House districts. It's not true for the Senate, because built into the original constitutional design is the idea that each state is entitled to two senators. And that means that a state like California gets equal representation in the Senate as a state like Wyoming, despite the massive differences in population. So what this means, there are a couple of things this means. One of the things that this means is when you combine this with the filibuster, it means that the minority of senators who can block legislative action often represent an even smaller minority of the population. Senators representing something like a third of the US population have the ability to block legislative action as otherwise broad support. The other problem though, is that it means sometimes a majority of the Senate, that is 50 senators plus the VP or 51 senators, may represent less than half of the US population, substantially less than half of the US population. And one of the things that this means, and now we'll get to the motivation for the project, there are many proposals right now to eliminate the filibuster. Eliminating the filibuster or creating exceptions to the filibuster would address one problem it would make it easier for majorities to advance their agenda and prevent the, major the minority from obstructing. But it would exacerbate potentially the second problem. Because if there were no filibuster, or in those situations where right now there is no filibuster, measures can pass out of the Senate with 50, 51, 52 votes, even though those senators in the majority represent substantially less than half of the US population. So, for example, a few years back under the Obama administration, when there was an effort to pass uh, the DREAM Act to protect uh, children who were brought to the United States illegally, but as children, uh, there was a majority of senators in support of that, but not enough to get to 60 votes in the Senate. So the bill was blocked by the filibuster. The senators in support represented well over half the population. But then you take something like the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act, the so-called Trump Tax Cuts. The Senate, that's governed by budget reconciliation. So uh, filibuster was not possible. The, the majority of senators who voted in favor of that represented only 40 something percent of the US population. So we think this is a problem. And then the question is, well, what do you do about it? Our proposal is instead of just eliminating the filibuster outright to change the Senate's current cloture rule so that debate must end when there's a motion to close debate that is supported by a simple majority of senators who represent collectively more of the US population than those senators who vote against closure. So it would still be the case that um, if you don't have 50 votes, you can't, or 51 votes or 50 votes plus the vice president, you can't move a matter forward. But even if you have a majority of senators who vote in favor of cloture, if that Senate majority represents less than half the US population, then debate must, must continue. In other words, those senators who collectively represent a majority of the population could filibuster, but otherwise we would operate by simple majority rule. And our argument is that that would make the Senate substantially more democratic and would do so without a constitutional amendment and without changing the two senators per state rule. It could be done internally. That's why we titled the paper Democratizing the Senate from Within. That could be done through a change to the Senate's own rules regarding the cloture process. And we think that would make the, the body more majoritarian and more legitimate, as well as more functional. Do you uh, then you know, have a reciprocal rule for the House where uh, if there's a majority, it has to represent more than half of the US geography? So. No, uh, that, that is geographic territory, no. We, because we don't think, frankly, there is no 
plausible normative philosophical justification for apportioning representatives uh, to population units that are vastly different in size. It's a his both that and the existence of the filibuster are the result of um, not principled decisions about what's best for democracy, but either a historical accident in the case of the filibuster or historical necessity in the case of equal representation in the Senate. So no, I certainly wouldn't apply any such rule to the House. And frankly, in the Senate, in my perfect world, I would apportion Senate seats on the basis of population. But again, the, the, the project is designed to ask what could be done without amending the Constitution, which is a practical matter is impossible. What could be done with the Senate's existing rules of procedure to move us to some, towards something closer to a genuinely democratic body? So for the this concept of the filibuster itself, where do you come down on that as a as a concept? Or right now it it functions it seems more as a veto, um, which in theory should be reserved for the president. Um, you know, in, according to the Constitution, what do you think the role of the filibuster should be? Is it you know should it should it still be allowed to delay legislation substantially when you have a substantial minority opposing a bill you know or do you discount it altogether and say it should be majoritarian once you factor in the population so that last point is important once you factor in the population so in our proposal we think that basically what we think is the legislators who represent a majority of the population should be able to do things pass laws confirm appointments and so forth. So in a perfect world, again, if we could, we could do a new constitution from scratch, we might just have a very different legislature. It might retain some features of the existing Senate, but the radical malapportionment wouldn't be there and the filibuster wouldn't be there. The fact that the Senate is so malapportioned, I think is the only plausible justification for retaining something like the filibuster. I think if we did not have malapportionment in the Senate, I would be perfectly happy with majority rule. I don't think that a requirement of supermajority rule for most Senate business is justifiable. There are certain items and they're specified in the Constitution where a supermajority is required, where you need two thirds of the Senate, for example. Um, but for ordinary legislative business, no, I would run it on a majoritarian basis. However, because the Senate is so badly malapportioned, this creates a potential justification for, I think, what in the tech world they would call a clutch, a kind of inelegant solution to a problem that you really wish didn't exist in the first place. The problem is the filibuster doesn't really work as a clutch because although it's true that under some circumstances when the Senate majority represents less than half the population, the filibuster functions as a majoritarian device, in other circumstances, it does exactly the opposite. It exacerbates the power of the problem of minority obstructions. So our proposed way around this is to build population representation directly into the cloture rule. And we believe you can do that for the same reason that the filibuster is allegedly constitutional in the first place, because votes to end debate are technically not final votes. They're internal procedural rules. And so maybe people ask, how, how is the filibuster even constitutional? Like, doesn't the Constitution specify where there's a supermajority requirement and there's no supermajority requirement? Isn't the assumption that ordinary rules of parliamentary procedure would apply, and that includes majority votes? And I think that's right. The defenders of the filibuster will say, but that only applies to final action. The filibuster is just the product of a procedural rule that allows debate to continue. And so what Professor Gould, Professor Shepsley, and I say is, okay, fine. Sauce for the goose is good for the gander. If you can do things with procedural rules that you couldn't do because of the constitution for final votes, then we also are not stuck with each senator gets equal voting power. Right? You can give senators different voting power if it's merely a preliminary procedural decision. So that's a very long answer to your question, but I think it's a little bit complicated because again, in my perfect world, there would be no filibuster, but there would also be no malapportionment. If there is malapportionment, then there should be filibuster of a kind, but not our current filibuster, which requires a supermajority of senators, rather a different kind of filibuster that can be maintained by a simple majority of senators who represent a majority of the population. Well, let me ask the question then more broadly, whether it applies to the Senate or the House in terms of, um, you know, the minority in term, in what its power basically is. Uh, to increase the costs of passage of a bill, 
right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it, you could say that a 51% supported bill incurs X cost and one that is supported by 99% of the body uh, imposes, X, you know, X, 2X costs or, or half of costs or whatever you, you have. You know, the, the filibuster seems to, or some mechanism of delay seems to create some outlet for intensity of, of opposition. Um, and do you support that notion or it doesn't matter whether it's 49% or 1% opposition, they should be able to cut off debate and vote? The latter. I think that the idea that the filibuster measures intensity of preference is a bit of a myth. It's a myth that derives from Hollywood treatments like Mr. Smith goes to Washington. It also derives from the old talking filibuster where people would have to hold the floor. As people have increasingly been pointing out, we shouldn't romanticize that. The most prominent uses of the so-called talking filibuster to represent intensity of the Senate were used principally to deny civil rights to black Americans or other minorities. So the filibuster, it wasn't invented exactly by the pre-Civil War Southern senators who wanted to protect slavery, but they were the ones who really started to make use of it extremely aggressively. And then in the middle of the 20th century, that was where we saw, so it was intensity of preference, but not in a way that I think is terribly credible. But even put all that aside, the modern filibuster due to reforms in the 1970s does not require one to hold the floor. It requires, so cloture votes can just be held and require 60 votes. If the cloture vote fails, then the matter doesn't proceed. So it's, it's free, essentially, for the minority. Now, this has led some people to say, well, we should bring back the talking filibuster. Then it would be used more sparingly, and it would measure intensity of preferences. I think there are a couple of problems with that. So first off, the reason these reforms in the 1970s were adopted is to prevent a situation where the entire Senate is ground to a halt. The Senate can't take up any other business because someone is filibustering. So it may be that someone has very intense preferences on a particular bill and wants to filibuster it, but if what that means is they actually have to hold the floor. So the Senate can't take up any other matter, no other appointments, no lifting the debt ceiling, no taking care of anything. That's a really big problem. So I think the reforms that allowed uh, cloture votes to take the form of just these up or down votes rather than having someone hold the floor were well-intentioned reforms that, that solved a real problem. And I'm not sure we want to return to that world where the body could be ground to a halt. Now, then you might say, well, but people would only do it really rarely, not necessarily as long as they can tag a team, right? As it doesn't need to be literally one senator. That senator can yield to another one. So unless you had a situation where one person had to hold the floor, like Jimmy Stewart and Mr. Smith goes to Washington, then that's not really what's happening. And no, none of the proposals on the table involve that. So if, for example, the current Senate minority wanted to filibuster a proposal the minority favor, they would just need to kind of do a, do a you know, I don't know what the, what, what the right metaphor would be, musical chairs, round robins, something like this, pass the baton, and could maintain it. And, and meanwhile, nothing else in the Senate could be happening. So I'm not hugely enthusiastic about the idea of like bringing back the talking filibuster so to measure intensity of preference. I don't think it really does that. And besides, I'm not sure intensity of preference matters that much intrinsically. If there are people who really have intense preferences on a particular policy matter, the normal way we imagine this gets worked out in legislative process is they'll be willing to make concessions on other things to stop or support a bill that they really care about, uh, as opposed to this kind of demonstrative thing where they stand up and talk for a long time or, or scream and shout. So yeah, I don't, I don't tend to think that that argument, I, I, find, I don't find that argument very compelling because what I care about is majoritarian democratic legitimacy. Right, and so also it seems beyond the preferences question, it's also the magnitude of opposition doesn't matter mm -hmm. as long as it's below 49% in your mind. Yes, I think generally. Now, again, there are interesting questions about whether 51% majority with who mildly prefer policy X should be able to prevail over a 49% minority who intensely prefer policy Y. But my answer to that is if that's really true, then this minority ought to be able to offer something to that 51% majority in the normal horse trading of the legislative process if they really care that much, not to grind the whole body to a halt, especially because given the way the system works right now, the 51% may care intensely and they, they're still blocked. Right? We don't really have a great way of, of measuring with, with scientific exactitude or, or anything close to it, 
intensity of preference in that manner. So again, I'm sure there are smart political scientists and economists out there who can come up with even better voting systems that work intensity of preference into account. Um, but again, the, the goal of our project is to work as much as possible within the existing framework and ask how could we adjust the existing cloture rules in order to achieve something uh, more closely resembling a legitimate majoritarian outcome. Right, well, let's move on to uh, the other subject, um, another subject that relates to your work, uh, which is this idea of Congress delegating its power. Yes. Uh, and, you, and you have several different pieces on this. One of them relates to uh, when, I guess, and to whom uh, Congress delegates its power. And then the other is once it's delegated, particularly in the instance of uh, regulatory agencies, uh, how does it effectively do oversight and what impact does that oversight have on the performance of the regulatory bodies? So can you talk through that area? What, what are your kind of fundamental interests in that space? What questions you ask and did you find anything interesting? Yeah, so a lot of what I have to say here is not at all original to me, but is the central preoccupation of one of the major fields of law that I study and teach. Um, typically in law school, we'll call that administrative law, but it's a bit broader. So Many of us learned back in our high school civics classes that Congress makes the law and that's the legislative power, and then the executive branch implements the law, that's the executive power, and then the courts adjudicate disputes. And that's not wrong exactly, but it's a significant oversimplification. Oftentimes, Congress does not, in its statutes, spell out all of the details, or even any of the details, of the rules that you and I and your listeners and other people have to follow. The Clean Air Act doesn't say exactly what kinds of pollution control technologies, power plants, or automobiles need to use. It doesn't say exactly what the allowable concentrations of sulfur dioxide or particulate matter are in the air. It delegates to the Environmental Protection Agency, which is an agency within the executive branch of government, the responsibility to promulgate regulations that will protect human health and the environment. Now, uh, before, the before you go on, I just want to make sure that, you know, in theory, Congress could do that regulation itself. It could set up its own kind of captive regulatory body that reported to it. So, and that split was made, whatever, 100, 100 plus years, 150 years ago. What do you feel like, before we move on to the existing situation, do you feel yes. like that split was legitimate or do you think that in the very beginning they should have kept it internal? I tend to think it was legitimate. I think there are a lot of problems with just how much power administrative agencies have and how it's exercised. I do think that oversight both by the courts and from Congress is important, but I am not in the camp that says this was a huge mistake, it was illegitimate, um, this all needs to be done by Congress, the regulatory bodies need to be within Congress. I think there are just a lot of practical advantages. And this goes back, by the way, this is, uh, there's this myth that this was a modern invention. Back at the founding, Congress was passing statutes that gave the Treasury Department or the various, or the President or various other uh, bureaus and departments substantial authority uh, to do what looks a whole lot like legislation, even if we don't want to call it that. Um, I think that there are, again, there are huge advantages to giving administrative agencies this kind of authority, and it fits uncomfortably, I recognize, with some, some of the theories of government that we learn. Um, but I think in practice, there are, there are substantial advantages to it, and it's, and it's a central feature of our system. Um, I should say another reason for doing this, frankly, uh, and this relates to the earlier part of our conversation, is congressional dysfunction. So when it's so difficult for Congress to legislate, even when, let's say, even the president's party has a majority in Congress, and it's so difficult to update statutes so that they can address contemporary problems, there will inevitably be enormous pressure on the president and the administration to aggressively construe the statutory authority that they have to do what they believe needs to be done and to advance their policy agendas. And this, is, this has been true of both Republican and Democratic presidents going back generations. It's, it's true right now with President Biden issuing a directive to the Department of Labor saying basically develop workplace safety standards that entail 
either uh, COVID vaccination or regular testing. So that would be an example of uh, inability of Congress to act on an important issue leading the executive branch to move. The Trump administration did similar sorts of things when it couldn't get Congress to pass the statutes that it wanted. Uh, the Obama administration, the, you just keep on going back. This, this happens all the time. And I tend to think it's, it's not intrinsically a bad thing. I think that um, government is big and complicated and the problems that confront our government are big and complicated and Congress has limited time and limited attention and limited resources, even if you didn't have all this dysfunction. And I tend to think that for pragmatic, practical reasons, which are entirely legitimate, uh, delegating substantial regulatory authority to the executive branch is valuable and legitimate. However, there are understandable concerns that if one is going to delegate this power to administrative agencies that are part of the executive branch, there need to be appropriate checks and balances. There needs to be appropriate oversight. So even for people like me who think the delegation is legitimate, that doesn't necessarily mean we should just give the executive carte blanche to do whatever. And then this relates back to our, the first part of our conversation when I talked about what issues really get me excited and really interested in. How do you design a system that maximizes the advantage of delegating policy decisions to administrative agencies and the executive while mitigating or ameliorating the concerns that are inherent in that kind of delegation? So you want the right kind of judicial and congressional oversight. You want enough presidential control, but not too much presidential interference. And that's the whole set of issues that I think are extremely interesting and extremely challenging. Um, one of the issues, though, is, again, it connects this issue of congressional dysfunction. When Congress is dysfunctional, then the agencies start to play more of a role and the courts start to play more of a role because Think about, think about this from a perspective of you're the executive branch of government, you're the president, there's some important issue that you want to address. What you would really like to do is go to Congress and get a statute passed that will address this issue or that will at least clarify your authority or give you the authority that you need. If you can't do this, you're going to try to get the executive branch agencies, which you oversee, to pursue your policy goals to the extent they can under their, their existing statutory authority. But oftentimes the statutes they're gonna be using are older statutes that were enacted with very different kinds of problems in mind. So you're probably gonna be pushing the limits. And then who's gonna decide if you pass those limits? The courts. And courts, we would like to imagine are completely dispassionate, politically neutral actors who just apply the law. But let's get real, we all know that that's not true, especially when the questions are questions not about very precise legal terms, but questions about whether the agency has acted rationally or whether some potentially ambiguous term in a statute has been reasonably read by the executive branch or whether they're stretching it just too far. And so I think that that, that raises a whole other set of problems. I would prefer to live in a world where it would be easier for the executive branch, for instance, to go to Congress to get clarification of the scope of its authority um, than the world we live in now, even while acknowledging that a great deal of congressional delegation to the administrative uh, bureaucracy is, in my view, appropriate. So you did a paper that talked about um, when you have this imperfect oversight of regulatory agencies that can have an impact on what you know, basically the outcomes from that agency, it's, it's, it's work product. What was your, what did you find? You know, what is the sweet spot for, for oversight or is there one? There isn't one. So we're, we're, there's no perfect solution. We're always trading off values. And this is, this is a theme that comes through very much when, I'm, when I teach my first year law students this material, we spend some time struggling with this. Um, courts struggle with this as well. It would be nice if there were some simple, easy, uh, neat solution. If you just had this form of oversight, you'd get things right. But we're constantly navigating between skill and charybdis. Like there's just no way around it. Uh, and that's, that's kind of just the world we live in. With respect to courts, uh, just to continue with that example, um, we like the idea that agencies have to behave lawfully. Many people believe 
that uh, judicial review, and here I'll quote a, a senior administrative law scholar from the mid 20th century, judicial review may be necessarily necessary psychologically, if not logically, to a system of administrative power that purports to be legitimate. I don't think, there are exceptions, but most people wouldn't wanna live in a world where courts didn't have a role in determining whether agencies had acted within the bounds of the law and where agencies could just decide for themselves without oversight what the law means. On the other hand, agencies have expertise in their policy domains that courts just don't have. Agencies through the president are accountable to the electorate in a way that courts just aren't. And many issues regarding the scope of agency authority are arguably not strictly speaking legal questions, but are questions about the right way to apply general legal standards to particular circumstances. So many people worry, understandably, about judicial overreaching, that instead of just policing the boundaries of what will be legal, courts will, dis will end up assuming for themselves a role that really should rest with the agencies and make policy. And so we're constantly trying to balance these considerations. Another place where we're struggling to balance these considerations has to do with the procedures that agencies have to follow, when the, the executive branch has to follow, when it makes these rules and regulations. We might say, well, if we're going to give agencies all of this power to do all this stuff, we better impose them some pretty significant procedural requirements. They should re be required to consult with members of the general public, before they take some significant action. They should be required to justify the decisions that they make in a manner that an ordinary person can understand. They should have to support their scientific or technical claims with adequate evidence that would pass muster according to the appropriate standards of science or economics or whatnot. On the other hand, the more we load down agencies with these procedural requirements, the more hoops they have to jump through, the harder it is for them to act the more difficult it is for them to respond to pressing problems. And that creates pressure to speed up the process, to move quickly. And again, it's a very, very difficult challenge. I used the example of, of President Biden's order to the Labor Department with respect to uh, COVID restrictions in the workplace as an example before, and I can invoke that again now. Uh, the specific thing that the Biden administration instructed the Labor Department to do is to issue what's called an, a temporary emergency standard under the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Normally, to, to promulgate workplace safety regulations, there's an extensive, elaborate process that the Labor Department has to go through. And it's understandable why that's there. The Labor Department's decisions can, they're to protect workers, but they can impose massive costs on companies. So there are procedural safeguards built in to make sure the Labor Department considers all the evidence and processes it, makes it available for public viewing and all this stuff. But that process can take literally years to promulgate a new workplace safety standard. So in an emergency situation, the statute creates an exception where you can put into place a temporary standard for six months without going through all this process. But how much can fit into that emergency exception? I believe the way the statute is framed is you can use a temporary emergency standard if doing so is necessary to prevent a grave risk to worker health or safety. And so there's about to be a fight that I suspect will be litigated in court about what counts as necessary and what counts as a grave risk and how much do we defer to the labor department's determinations on those points and how much should a court independently assess whether the evidence really shows that the risk is grave and the standard is necessary. And again, there's no easy answer to this question. And there's no easy answer to the question of who gets to decide this. You know, it's interesting you bring up this emergency um, power because it's the interesting thing about that power is that it's limited by time, right? So it's a six month, um, the law or the, or the regulation or what have you has a, as a, as a limited time window. You know, when you talk, when you think about regulations versus Congress, you know, I'm always struck by the fact that whenever Congress makes a law, it thinks that it, that law should be immortal and live forever. It has no self-destruct mechanism, no way to, no, no sunset for the most part. Uh, and it seems that regulations play the same role uh, where you have a temporary group uh, that's making a rule that will last potentially for eternity. Do you have a, a position on that, you know, since you're bringing up this emergency power, which relates to a six month period, has an automatic sunset, what do you think about that as, as it relates to, you know, the, the regulators? 
So before I answer that question, I want to gently push back on your initial suggestion that Congress doesn't include sunsets in its legislation. In fact, it very often does. Uh, in, in fact, to connect this to our earlier part of our conversation, this is often a point of negotiation. It's happening right now with respect to, for example, the budget reconciliation bill, where progressive Democrats and centrist Democrats are fighting over what's going to be in there. And I gather just from news reports that one of the items under discussion is whether some of these provisions will sunset earlier. Um, my colleague Jake Gerson years ago wrote a nice law review article called Temporary Legislation that really emphasized the degree to which many statutes do contain these sunsets. But you're not wrong. Many statutes do. They don't necessarily live forever, but there's no built-in end date, which is precisely why, for example, we are sometimes taking statutes from the 1930s and figuring out how they apply to modern technologies that were not even a, a dream back then. So that's absolutely right. Um, regulators also do sometimes build uh, sunsets into their regulatory policies or have lookbacks. So one of the things the Obama administration did was they actually told agencies to the extent permitted by law, they should do some retrospective assessments of their regulations that they had in place and figure out whether any of them should be altered or modified. Um, I think that sometimes it makes sense to include an automatic expiration date on regulations, but, but not always. It's not obvious to me that that's uh, necessarily essential, especially because it is easier to change a regulation than it is to change a statute. Now, that doesn't mean it's super easy to change a regulation. Again, there's an elaborate process. It may, might take 18 months to enact a new regulation, and it might take another 18 months to withdraw that regulation or to substantially change it. Um, but it still can be done a bit more quickly. So I think that I'd be, I think it's kind of on an ad hoc basis building in time limitations to statutes or regulations might sometimes be appropriate. Sometimes it might be necessary in the legislative process to get the thing passed in the first place to have a, a known expiration date. But I'm not sure that really gets to the, the heart of the challenge. So in terms of the oversight of the regulators, mm -hmm. um, you see the, the, the balancing act that has to happen. Uh, you don't have a prescriptive solution for best practices or where it's worked well in the past or where it's really bad and we should avoid that area? Any, any conclusions? Not that I could sum up succinctly in a conversation like this one. Um, it's again, it's, it's just so complicated. Again, I think the story of at least the, the latter part of the 20th century going into the 21st century has been increased polarization and dysfunction in Congress has meant that presidential administrations of both parties have been even more aggressive than they had previously in trying to advance their domestic policy agendas through administrative regulation. And as they've pushed the envelope, it has provoked courts to become more aggressive in reviewing what agencies have done and perhaps to some degree less trustful or in instinctively deferential to what agencies have done. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric about how a lot of these decisions should be made by Congress. And while I'm sympathetic to that rhetoric, I keep coming back to this theme. When you have a Congress that doesn't seem to be able to act on these issues, that is uh, due to a combination of institutional mechanisms that facilitate obstructionism and the polarization that has so dominated political news and political discussions for the last generation. Um, I think that it's a little bit unrealistic to just say blithely, well, the, with, what Congress should really be dealing with this. But that, that's the story. And I think that's kind of the, the world that we live in. And especially given that we just had a recent transition in control of the White House, I think that this is useful for all parties to debate because the kinds of rules that you might like when, when your guys, as it were, uh, were at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue uh, might not be the rules that look so great when the other guys have control of the executive branch. And what we're trying to do in principle is to come up with a set of rules that will be appropriate and fair and legitimate, uh, notwithstanding uh, the first order policy preferences of the executive branch and Congress and the courts. And it's just very, very challenging. So when we're talking about regulation, obviously the, the big argument is that regulators have a lot more information about what's happening and, and that gets, lets them to be the right locus of decision-making for what uh, 
regulations there should be um, in a particular industry or in a particular sector or what have you. Uh, and so you've done a lot of work just more on a theoretical or general basis about the con, you know, the, this concept of information flow. And yes. in particular, you, you've addressed that for legislatures. And I'm very interested in this subject about, you know, what, what are the processes by which uh, the legislature and Congress collects information and then processes it and then uses that information? And I think you've focused a little bit more on the acquisition of information, but could you talk us through that? What have you done in that space and what have you found there? Yeah, so again, you're putting your finger on a really, really challenging problem, which is that, you know, much of our political discourse focuses on differences in values. And I think that's really, really important because there are fundamental differences in values and priorities. But a lot of differences of opinion come down to differences in empirical judgments about the likely consequences of different policies. Um, you know, people might differ in terms of how much economic cost they think we should be willing to impose in the economy to reduce the probability of a certain level of mortality by a certain amount. But even people who agree on that could just have very different senses of how expensive will this regulation be. Um, you know, you think, you think about the, uh, a proposal to impose new emissions limitations on power plants to address greenhouse gases. Some people predict that such and such regulation will have massive economic costs and will cause electricity prices to spike and consumers to suffer. Um, and they might also say that actually man-made human caused global warming is not that big of a problem. And other people will say that's completely wrong and that the costs are gonna be relatively uh, modest or maybe even non-existent in the long term. and the harms we're trying to avert are huge. So very often, even though a lot of times the, the fight will be about values and partisanship and all that, certainly within the agencies and the professional staffs on legislatures, people care a lot about information. And how do we make the best judgment we can under situations of phenomenal uncertainty? Nobody knows for sure on a lot of these questions, but we have to make our best guess. So how do we get this information? It's extremely challenging. Um, part of it has to do with people, right? Part of it has to do with staffing, um, both executive branch agencies and also uh, on the legislative side, important positions with people who know what they're talking about and know what they're doing and to be able to retain people like that. A major concern that I think go, flies under the radar a little bit is what we might call the hollowing out of our government and public service as people who really know a lot about what they're doing or have a high capacity to process information um, leave if we make their jobs too unpleasant or not rewarding enough. I actually think that attracting really good people to work in public service is vitally important. Right? I mean, I know you have a private sector background, but you're also now working at Sunwater, which is a public interest type of a group. Um, talented young people coming out of university, a lot of those people could go into the private sector and do very well. And many of them, though, might consider a public sector job because they think it may be more interesting to them or because they're attracted to the idea of public service or so forth. Um, but if you really want to get really good people, you need to make those jobs attractive and you need to retain them. And you need to give people an incentive not just to take those jobs out of college or graduate school, but to stay in them. Because when you're in government, the same way you're in any profession, you develop some job-specific expertise. And if those people leave, you know, go join the private sector or the academy or whatever, that, that's a huge loss. So I actually think an issue that we don't pay enough attention to is uh, to attract good people and good, smart, expert people into public service and, and keep them there. I would say that um, another issue of concern is that oftentimes the people who know the most about a subject, who have the most relevant technical information to provide, are not exactly neutral parties. So people talk about a lot about lobbyists and lobbying, and for good reason. And I think uh, a lot of people have this image of the way lobbyists operate as essentially bribing politicians, if not necessarily in the legal sense, although that might happen sometimes too, but you know, offering campaign donations and showering people with gifts and taking them out to fancy dinners and getting them to vote the way they want. And for sure that happens. But what I think people don't appreciate as much is what a lot of sophisticated lobbyists do is they provide legislators and to some extent as well regulators with information, right? They're the often well-financed interest groups of the people who can hire 
staffs of really smart people who can prepare great glossy presentations and PowerPoints and do surveys and fund studies and do all this stuff so that at the moment when important decisions are made, the, the people who can supply the expertise, again, are not ideologically or politically neutral people. And that can bias the outcomes of policy in favor of the people who can become the reliable sources of information. So I think that, I think an issue that we need to think more about is how to counteract that so that um, our decision makers can be getting information from technical experts from other directions. I mean, I remember talking to a business school professor years ago who described a particular accounting rule that was being made. It was a, a very obscure technical thing. Like the, there are like six people in the world who even understand why this is important and they're all working at investment banks. And so those are the people in the room explaining to the regulators why they got to do what they, what they have to do. So I think that's another issue with respect to information that's hugely important. I think that you referred to legislatures before and their capacity to acquire information. I, I, and I, I resisted the idea that there was a problem with delegation, the legislature should be doing all, all this stuff itself. But I think there's a case to be made that Congress's informational capacities, its research capacities, all this stuff could be greater than it currently is. So that, again, so that legislators have sources of information research you know, beyond the existing uh, Congressional Research Service, even though they do great work, for example, um, to, to help them in this matter. So these are these are some of the things that I think would be relevant to address this problem. But you know, in, information is the lifeblood of effective government. You just can't make good decisions if you don't have information. Even if you have all the information, it can be very difficult to make the right decision because the information is is incomplete. But absolutely, finding ways to promote more informed decision making. I think is, is critically important. I think this information discussion also plays into the nature of, of debate, right? When you have a debate around values, judgments, um, you know, there's no logical middle ground in many cases, right? Both, both it's a less than zero sum game uh, for potentially both value holders. Uh, whereas in quantitative decisions, in theory, there can be, there can be compromise. Um, and, in some of the decision-making you've described where you have to, everyone has to have a model of the future, right? And a causal chain in their mind, right? If we do this, this will happen. If I do that, that will happen. They have different assumptions in that model and they have different predictions about the way the future is going to go. Now, I, I'm, I wonder whether there's a better way for debate dialogue to happen in Congress that would separate these kinds of debates you know, some of them quantitative, some of them assumptions based, some of them values based and untangle them from each other in a way that, you know, there's better conversation and there's better resolution. I, I, I would hope that that were so. I think it's a challenge. So when you say debate, let's differentiate the formal debate that happens in the chamber from the broader debate and conversation, negotiation and so forth. I tend to think that the debate that actually happens in the chamber is not real debate and it's not meant to be and never will be. Um, those are speeches aimed at constituents and lobbyists and others. And nobody ever, I would be shocked if anyone ever changed anyone's mind, at least with respect to a colleague's mind, by giving a rousing speech on the floor of the Senate, the floor of the House. That just doesn't happen. But- you're sure, big, you're, So you're the ultimate pessimist when it comes to speeches. Yeah, I mean, in, in other contexts, maybe not, right? I, I've been at faculty meetings, right? Where a colleague has made a point about some decision we're taking collectively as a faculty that's caused me to change my mind. Um, I've been at academic conferences where someone has made a valuable point in debate that's caused me to change my mind. So I'm not generally a pessimist that no one ever changes their mind about anything. But on the floor of the, of the US Congress, that's not a real debate, those are speeches. Uh, and they're, they're carefully calibrated and calculated, like, no, no, that's not going to change anybody's mind. But that doesn't mean that there's not dialogue and discourse and persuasion, or at least that it's not possible. I do tend to think, actually, to return to our earlier conversation, that it's easier for that sort of conversation, like, what's at, like we basically agree on what we're trying to accomplish, like, what's the best policy? One of the reasons I'm more pro-delegation to agencies than other people is I am of the belief that that tends to happen more and it's easier for that to happen in the agencies 
than it is in Congress. Um, and I recognize all the concerns about democratic accountability and who are these bureaucrats and nobody elected them and for sure. That's why I think oversight by the president, oversight by Congress is very important. But I also think there's a value to sometimes letting those professionals have a little bit of breathing space, put them at arm's length from the political decision makers and give them a general direction of what they're trying to accomplish and let them figure it out. And we see this in moments of crisis, right? In moments of a pandemic, we turn to our infectious disease specialists and our public health specialists. And like, what are we supposed to do? After the 2007, 2008 financial crisis, you know, we, we, President Bush very much turned things over to Hank Paulson and his team at Treasury to figure out what was supposed to be going on. So I think there are often moments when even the most political of political people recognize that we need to let the experts debate these issues. And again, without suggesting that the, the so-called experts are experts in political value judgments, which they're not, um, we absolutely need to have democratic accountability and democratic oversight. But in terms of facilitating the kind of debate you were just describing, you know, do we need a booster shot for COVID? Should there be mass mandates in school? Like those kinds of decisions, I don't think it's really, I don't think we're going to get to a closer answer by allowing mem elected members of the House and Senate to debate those issues, whether on the floor or otherwise. I want to get a, like a bunch of scientists and epidemiologists and so forth in a room to look at the data to try to figure that out. Um, so yeah, so that's one of the reasons I'm actually a little bit more enthusiastic about that kind of delegation, but there's always an on the other hand. And the on the other hand is ultimately, these are not purely, I resist the idea that any of these decisions can be purely apolitical, just technical decisions. Because at the end of the day, you're always trading off values, right? So I'm sure that a COVID booster shot and more aggressive mass mandates would reduce by some increment incidence of disease and morbidity and mortality. I also suspect that those things would have costs. And ultimately, how we trade off the costs against the benefits is not purely a technical matter. That's a, that's a political matter. And by political, I don't mean a partisan political matter. We use the word political in different senses. Sometimes we mean Democrat versus Republican political, but sometimes we, we mean political more in the sense of a decision about what the polity should do and how we should collectively trade off important competing values. So I love the idea of giving the professionals room to have the kinds of debates that you're talking about. I would like to give them more space to have those debates, but at some point there also needs to be a decision made through the political process about how to take the information that they give us and make the right decisions. That's why I'm a little bit, I, I understand the rhetoric of let's follow the science. I, I, I agree with what that rhetoric is trying to accomplish in our current situation, but there's a sense in which that's, that slogan is an oversimplification because you can't answer the question what public health measures should be put in place just by saying let's follow the science. The science will tell us something about risk levels and cost levels, but then we need to make a collective decision as a polity about what trade-offs we're willing to make. Yeah, I think the trade-offs are the key thing. I mean, the agency's mandate may be limited to calculating certain kinds of costs, but not others. And only Congress can take in all of the costs, right? Uh, and, and look at it holistically in theory, since the agency is only a, a partial, has a partial control. Maybe, but that's a little bit of an idealized view of Congress, right? To come back to the earlier part of our conversation, I might say, well, in my perfect world, we would have a democratically representative legislature that would be sufficiently tethered to the views of the people where the members would be sufficiently concerned with the welfare of their constituents, that exactly, that's how they would make decisions. I'm not sure if we actually live in that world, which creates some very uncomfortable questions about how decisions should be made. Uh, I think that one thing that we really need to face up to in this country is are the deficiencies in our political system from a democratic legitimacy perspective and figure out ideally how to fix them. Uh, but if we can't fix them in the short term, what the implications are of those deficiencies for how we make collective decisions. Right, well, let's, let me ask you a question about one other area of your research, and unfortunately, we won't be able to get to all of them today, but uh, just to take a few minutes to talk about your work on corruption. Um, now, obviously, there's a very narrow definition of corruption, uh, and then there's a very broad sense of kind of uh, legislative or control, you could call it, of someone. Uh, can you talk through a little bit about what you're doing on corruption and as much as you can tie it to the US, although I know you're doing international work, 
But, uh, you know, as what is your kind of working definition of corruption and um, how does it manifest in the U.S. Congress? Sure. So when you say you're, you're studying corruption, inevitably there are some challenges of figuring out, well, how are you defining that term? The conventional definition of corruption that many advocacy groups and international organizations use these days is something like the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. I think the original, it was something like the abuse of public power for private gain, but then there was a recognition that people in non-governmental organizations, private companies, universities, uh, international bodies and so forth may also be corrupt. They can take bribes, they can embezzle. And so we should say entrusted power rather than public power. But the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. Uh, well, what does that mean? That definition has a bunch of ambiguities baked into it. So what counts as abuse? Uh, what counts as private gain? Do we say something is corrupt if it's illegal? Uh, do we say something is corrupt if, it, if the act is gen generally viewed as improper, whether or not it's illegal? Um, do we say it's corrupt if it distorts or uh, undermines uh, legitimate democratic decision-making processes, even if no one thinks there's anything particularly wrong with it? All sorts of complicated questions. I tend to not want to get too hung up on the definitional questions. Corruption is a word that just is used in different senses. None of them are you know, necessarily always right or always wrong. Some people, as you say, use corruption in a narrow sense, and other people use it in a broad sense. My own research in this area tends to focus on corruption more narrowly defined. And that's not because, again, I think that's the right definition of corruption, the only definition of corruption. It's that I got interested in problems related to bribery, embezzlement, nepotism, conflict of interest, et cetera. And that cluster of issues typically gets labeled corruption or a, corrupt, or a, a, a corruption agenda. Now, with respect to the United States, we have plenty of that kind of corruption. So on a, on a global scale, um, that problem is less significant in the United States than it is elsewhere, at least if you believe these various corruption perceptions measures. Um, but we still have it. I and mean, if you read the newspaper, right, you'll see reports of unlawful corruption. The United States Department of Justice has a whole section, the public integrity section, that investigates and prosecutes violations of federal laws pertaining to various forms of corruption. And that department is plenty busy, right? They submitted an annual report to Congress and they're doing a lot. So we have plenty of that kind of garden variety. Uh, I shouldn't, that minimize it. I should, so, so, so illegal corruption, uh, bribery, embezzlement, conflict of interest, et cetera. It's, it exists and it's a big problem. Now, some people would prefer to use a broader definition of corruption to describe patterns of influence in, for example, the United States Congress, the outside role, outsized role, excuse me, of lobbyists, uh, the degree to which legislators are responsive to big donors, even if there's no quid pro quo, many people think of it as not just a problem, but a form of corruption, that individual people are allowed to make such large donations to uh, political action committees or directly to candidates, and then those candidates vote on matters that, that directly affect the interests of these donors. I entirely understand why many people would say, that's corrupt. And as I said before, I have no interest in litigating definitions. What I would say, one place, one thing that I do resist, and sometimes there's this argument that you see that actually there's just as much corruption in the United States as there was in the United States 150 years ago, or as there is in modern Cambodia or Russia or Sri Lanka or Bangladesh or what have you. And the argument is the US hasn't really eliminated corruption, we've just legalized it. Look at the lobbyists, look at the campaign donors and so forth. I resist that in part because based on my study, both of US history and of the situation in other countries, while I'm very, very concerned about excess money in politics in the United States, there's just an important difference between the methods of influence that are used in the United States through legal channels of lobbying, for example, and outright bribery for decisions in terms of the distorting effect that it has on the public policy process, it's just different. Um, and it has different consequences. The consequences are much more severe when outright bribery or embezzlement are widespread the way they are in many other parts of the world and the way they were in the United States 
150 years ago. The analogy that I sometimes like to use to drive home the point that I'm trying to make is that if you look at the US judicial system, there are a variety of ways in which it's biased in favor of the wealthy. Wealthy people can hire better lawyers, and pay them more, and have sophisticated people on staff, and they may be repeat participants in the litigation process and just be very good at it. So um, that's unfair, and it's bad, and it's a real problem that there are so many advantages that wealthy people have just because they can use their wealth to hire better legal counsel, legal advice, and so forth. This is not the same as systems where people can just bribe the judge to get the outcome they want. The fact that the, the use of money to gain the advantage has to be filtered through the hiring of better lawyers and presenting arguments in a particular way and so forth means that even though this is a problem that creates an, un, an uneven playing field in, a, in an area where it's supposed to be totally fair, um, it's not nearly as big a problem as systems where it is routine that the judge will rule in favor of whoever gives him the bigger bribe. And I think that's, I, I would draw a similar analogy to the political process. So wealthy private interests can monitor the legislative process. They can develop a better relationship with legislators. They can hire fancy lobbyists who will gather information in the way that I suggested before, present it very effectively, mobilize voters in a way that's very effective. All of this is a problem. But there are situations and again, this would be true in the United States in the past. Uh, it's true in other countries today where it is routine for legislative decisions to be made based on who gives the legislators the most money or money equivalent. So I actually, I actually do think there's a really big difference. Um, the, other, the other issue that relates to US Congress and corruption, at least the way I study it, is there has recently been some encouraging legislative action to address corruption in a variety of forms. Uh, last year, the US Congress finally passed the Corporate Transparency Act, which requires the disclosure of the identities of people who own companies. There's additional legislation pending right now that would strengthen US anti-corruption laws in a variety of respects. We we're having this conversation two days after the so-called Pandora Papers story just broke, illustrating the ways that um, kleptocrats and human rights abusers and others have abused, for example, the trust system in the United States and taken advantage of certain US states that provide excessive secrecy uh, with respect to corporate ownership or trust control. So I am hoping that we will see further action in the US Congress, despite all of the dysfunctions that I complained about earlier in our conversation, to close some of these gaps and loopholes to address this problem. It's actually one of the rare places uh, in the last few years what I've, where I've seen an encouraging degree of bipartisan agreement on the need to crack down on some of these issues. So that gives me actually a little bit of hope. Um, just one question on your corruption concept is it relates to parties, right? So, you know, political parties, most of what you described to me sounds almost like political parties, right? Political parties give to campaigns, personal gain, you know, the, the political parties control chairmanships uh, and minority ranking members uh, in committees, you know, those sound like personal gains for cash. Uh, now, I know political parties somehow exempted, exempted themselves from this corruption definition, but I'm curious about your approach to the issue of political parties, since they seem to be operating on this exact same mechanism. So I'm not sure it's exactly the same. I'm not sure a party saying we're going to support you and the party suggesting that the people who do a better job supporting it will get higher or more senior positions in the party would quite fit that definition of corruption. But again, I don't want to litigate the definitions. In terms of my general view on political parties, um, I actually I am a pretty big fan of political parties as a general matter. I think right now in the United States, we have a lot of problems with how, how they're organized and what their incentives are. But in a big and complicated society, this is how we organize political competition. Parties have brands and they have platforms and uh, they, have a, they have an identity that goes beyond any individual politician, or at least we hope that they would. And I think that's basically a good thing from the, from the health of a, of a democratic polity. I mean, the other option in weak democracies is that everything is personal and that you don't have sustained parties that have a recognizable political platform or ideological agenda. It's just about charismatic leaders who promise particularistic benefits to their supporters. So I'm pretty pro-party in the abstract. Um, I certainly think that there are problems, and maybe this is what you're getting at, 
concerns about the way parties may sometimes enforce party discipline in ways that might not be as productive to certain aspects of how our democracy functions, um, promising the best positions to the people who raise the most money for the party strikes me as certainly a matter, a matter of concern. I don't like that development. But if I were making my list of dysfunctions and pathologies in the modern United States political system that I would really like to address, the existence of political parties probably wouldn't make my top 10 list. I think parties in the abstract are fine. Um, I think the way that some political parties or party operatives in the United States behave is a consequence of other rules that are in the system that I really would like to change. And to come back to the earlier part of our conversation, malapportionment in the Senate, for example, means that to the extent that the parties have national brands, those parties that have a built-in structural advantage with, because of malapportionment, for example, or because in the house of things like partisan gerrymandering uh, and so forth, have less of an incentive to be more moderate to pitch to the center and try to attract the support of uh, a larger mass of voters. I think what most political parties or political leaders or party leaders are trying to do is there's a trade-off they face too. So their donors and activists tend to push them to a more extreme wing further from the center of American politics, but the desire to win elections pulls them back towards the center. And there's kind of this, the people who are managing the party's national brand are constantly dealing with this because your donors and your hard hardcore activists are, are want you to go further uh, to the left or to the right. Um, but you're nervous about doing that because if your brand starts to seem too extreme, then you might start losing elections. If there are built in structural biases that mean that you don't pay as much of an electoral cost if you adopt more extreme positions, then in that push pull struggle, you'll tend to become more extreme. The electoral cost of placating your donors or appeasing your activist class decreases when it kind of doesn't matter if you lose a bunch of votes because you can still win a presidential election with less than 50% of the vote, or you can still have a blocking coalition in the Senate with only 41 senators. So, and you can maybe even get a majority in the Senate, even if the people who support you are less, are well under 50% of the population. So I actually think that the, the, the asymmetric polarization which is the term that many of my political scientist friends would use. The extremism in US politics right now is not a separate phenomenon from these structural biases and um, difficulties with the, the way our institutions are structured. They are, in my view, a, in, in substantial measure, a consequence of those things because parties don't pay, at least one party right now in our national, at the national level, doesn't pay as much of a cost if it adopts relatively extreme positions. And I think that's bad for democracy. I mean, majoritarian democracy has all sorts of problems, right? As Winston Churchill once famously said, and I'll paraphrase, it's the worst system of government except all the other ones that have been tried from time to time. But right now in the United States, we do not have majoritarian democracy as our principal system of government at the legislative level. We just don't. We like to tell ourselves that we're the world's oldest democracy, but like there's an important sense in which we are not currently a full democracy. And um, that's painful to hear. But I think, I think that it's, it's true. And we need to confront that fact and figure out what to do with that. All right, well, I'm going to move on now to our, uh, our common questions. I ask all of our guests. Sure. We'll try to get these through these a little bit quicker um, so that we can uh, uh, let you on your way. So the, uh, my, my first question on this group is, what do you think congressional representation should mean? So... Um, one aspect of congressional representation, which we've, all, we've already emphasized in this conversation, is um, representation of the people in the sense that each representative should represent approximately the same number of people. Um, we have in this country representation by geographic units. I'm deeply skeptical if that's actually the right way to do it. We're stuck with it. Like That's what we've got. But I tend to think that represent, we have representation if we have something approximating one person, one vote, and, the, and a constant ratio of population to voting power in the legislature. Beyond that, there are two principal theories. This goes back to Madison and others of what representatives are supposed to be. What this is sometimes called the delegate theory and the trustees theory. So in one theory, members of Congress represent their constituents by doing what their constituents would have done if the constituents had all the information at the time. 
The trustee theory is to do what you think is right for your constituents, even if you don't think that's what the, your constituents would have wanted if it were put up for a plebiscite. Both of these, I think, have arguments in their favor. I instinctively lean more toward the trustee theory. I think that members of Congress or uh, other elected representatives should do what they think is right for their constituents, what's in their constituents' best interest, not necessarily what their constituents would vote for in a direct democracy system. But it's not genuinely representative if some members uh, represent far fewer members than other representatives do. Uh, and I really wish we had a system in which uh, people represented groups that were not as uh, gerrymandered, frankly, to limit the representation in ways that are, are designed to favor the interests of the elected representatives. I think that is unhealthy for democracy. And so it seems that you, but, but part of your definition sounds like the even in your trustee model, um, that a person represents, a member, a representative would represent the entire district or state Absolutely. as Absolutely. opposed to I, a, just a, you know, a, a small portion of that group or the majority of the voters or what have you. Absolutely. I think that, uh, you know, President Biden, others have used this rhetoric in, in speeches that I'm there. I represent all of you, not just those of you who voted for me. And I think that's absolutely right. I'm not a fool, right? I'm a realist. I know that in reality, members of Congress or other elected representatives are much more responsive to their supporters or perhaps especially responsive to the people who might be tempted to vote for the other guy. But at least in principle, if we're talking about the ideal of representation, yes, an elected member should do what he or she thinks is best for the community as a whole and for his or her constituents. And what do you think about the future uh, in terms of future generations within a district or state? Uh, does the current representative also represent those future voters, those future citizens? Yes, I think that it's fair to place more weight on the interests of current voters and current constituents, partly because they're known uh, and the issues they face are known. But yes, I, I absolutely think that all of us should care about future generations. And that, and that you know, I, again, I think of elected representative positions as positions of stewardship of public service to the country and doing what is in the interest of the country and frankly of the world too, requires thinking about the future, not, not a focus entirely in the short term. So yeah, I, I think that's, I would agree with that entirely. Right, next question is, uh, how would your ideal Congress allocate its time? And by this, I mean, DC versus district, uh, legislation versus oversight? Um, I don't have a very clear sense of DC versus district. I don't have a super clear sense of legislation versus oversight. I would like to see uh, a lot more legislation, oversight versus fundraising activities and various other things that are not really doing the people's business. Uh, whether that involves spending more time in the district talking to people or more time in D.C., interacting with your fellow legislators. I don't have particularly strong feelings about that. I, this is what I don't have the expertise to know uh, about your geographic location. Um, but legislation and oversight are the, are the two big jobs. And I kind of wish it wasn't fundraising and campaigning 24-7 all the time. Right. Next question is, uh, how, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, how should debate, deliberation, or dialogue occur or be structured in Congress? And so you've already talked about the floor as being a stylized speech uh, location. What about, uh, you know, where this debate, where this kind of dialogue discussion actually happens? Is it committees? Is it behind closed doors? Is it open? Oh, I mean, committee hearings, I think, are also for sure, mostly. Um, I think a lot of it takes place behind closed doors. I mean, again, to be clear, the floor statements and the committee hearings and so forth, there's a reason for the show. It's kind of public communication. People signal where they stand on important issues and that's valuable as voters. Like we, we, need to, we need to know that information, so that's useful. But it's not debate or deliberation in the sense of actually trying to persuade people to change their mind or sharing information with them. I think that um, a lot of that happens, uh, again, behind closed doors, a lot of it happens at the professional staff level without denigrating the importance of high level contacts between the members. I mean, right now, President Biden is in regular contact, I'm sure in person with Senator Manchin, Senator Sinema and others. Um, but a lot of this takes place at the professional staff. Level. 
Uh, I think that you know, one thing that a, a, another law professor wrote recently that really resonated is we really need to think of members of Congress at this point as kind of like CEOs of little corporations. I mean, they're, and we don't expect the CEO of a corporation to be making every kind of decision on every matter that's important to the company. They, ha they hire people who are their experts who advise them. They, the, the CEO has the final say, but a lot of this gets farmed out. There's a kind of internal delegation within congressional offices. And again, as you probably uh, gathered from our earlier exchange about professional staff at the administrative level, I love professionals. Like I love professional staff, people like know what they're doing and are not necessarily in the limelight, but like really know these substantive policy areas. And so I think a lot of de debate, deliberation, dialogue in Congress will occur at that professional staff level. As I said in our earlier conversation, I would love to find ways to create more opportunities for people who really know these issues, but who are not the kind of usual suspects of vested interest and so forth, to have more of an opportunity to engage. Um, I think that's a deficiency in our current deliberative system in terms of whose voices get heard, and frankly, whose voices get taken seriously, and who's treated as frivolous. And I think there are some real pathologies in our political culture about who is deemed a serious person and who is deemed a non-serious person. And I think the deliberation dialogue in Congress would be improved if we could remedy some of those pathologies. Great, next question is, uh, and I think you already answered it with the Senate, but I'd be curious to hear, uh, what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within 50 years? Yeah, so I would love, as, as we said at the beginning, I would love the Senate to change its rules to, to make it more majoritarian. The way that professors uh, Shepsi Gould and I propose is through this majority cloture rule. I'm sure there are others. On the House side, uh, I think addressing partisan gerrymandering is the would be my number one priority. Campaign finance reform and lobbying reform would be nice too, but on the House side, I think partisan gerrymandering is a, is just a massive problem. So if we could address that and get something like nonpartisan districting commissions uh, to to allocate congressional, uh, to, to allocate districts, that would be, I think, the most important reform to see on the House side. All right, what, what uh, book or article most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform? I wish I could name one. I don't really have a, a specific book or article on that front. It's more just like having had the opportunity for many years to talk with smart people who think about these issues, but uh, I don't have one, like this is the thing everyone should read. Great. Well, the last one, you know, is just about your plans. You've already, you know, done so much work in a number of different, very uh, relevant areas to Congress performance and oversight. You know, what, what's, what's in the hopper for you? What's in the plan? And uh, what are you working on now? And where do you see yourself in, in the future? So I don't like to plan too far ahead. One of the nice things about being a professor is that you have a lot of freedom to work on whatever strikes you as interesting. Um, I'm going to continue my work on transnational corruption, which I think is a very important problem. Most of my work on that topic is focused outside the United States. Um, but I do think these issues related to hidden assets, money laundering, shell companies, and so forth are, are important. And I would like to spend more time thinking about those issues. With respect to the United States, uh, the issues of congressional reform are actually relatively new for me. I've thought about delegation, administration, separation of powers for some time, but it's really within the last year or two that I've started thinking a lot more about institutional reform of US Congress. The paper that we spent a fair amount of time talking about with Professors Gould and Shepsley uh, is one of my first forays in this area. I'm working on another project with my colleague, Jody Freeman, about a non-traditional use of the Congressional Review Act in order to avoid the filibuster for purposes of clarifying the statutes that agencies administer to address another one of the topics that we discussed. And I do feel like right now, I would like to find more ways to work on these kinds of issues because I do think it's really, really important. And the kind of work in this area that I, I have done and that I expect I'll probably do more of is work that proposes institutional reforms that would not require a constitutional amendment or a radical change in the composition of the Supreme Court or Supreme Court doctrine. Colleagues in the Legal Academy, who are doing work that I deeply respect and is very important, are focused on proposals for constitutional change or proposals for what judicial doctrine should be in certain areas. And again, I think that work is very important, but I think that the odds of constitutional change are, are very low. And I think that the current Supreme Court does not have very much appetite for some of the kinds of doctrinal changes that many people who care about 
democratic dysfunction have been focused on. So I'm interested in this increasing uh, genre of literature that thinks about how can we work within the existing system, including how could we take advantage of what seem like loopholes within the existing system to make it more democratic. And I think that's something that where maybe law professors could actually be helpful because that's the way our minds work. Those are the kinds of things that we look at. We're not necessarily bound by what's immediately practical, but we're also trained to think about what does the law allow or how can the law be used to achieve these particular ends. So um, I think that I would like to do more work along those lines. And I hope that other people do too, uh, in conjunction with people working in the political arena in ways that I just don't and can't to increase political support for reform from within. I think reform from without is extraordinarily unlikely. So I think we have to hope uh, that the result of persuasion efforts and election results over the next decade builds up sufficient, sufficient support for internal reform that we can democratize our system. Right, well, Professor Stevenson, thank you so much for your time. It's been a, it's been a pleasure and uh, best of luck with your future work. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed the conversation.